to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim. Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn King. Christ by highest heaven adored. Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold Him come. Offspring of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead seed. Hail the incarnate deity. Please this man with men to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn King. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the You may be seated. I want to welcome you here this morning, and at this time we're going to have our First Step children come, and they're going to present their Christmas pageant to you. I think they're coming. I saw them practice. Uh, it's interesting. It'll be great. <laughs>
part. <laughs> Come on. Go up there with your other puppy friend. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> okay, you ready? In the barn on Christmas Eve, after all the people leave, the animals in voices low remember Christmas long ago. One small hen upon her nest softly clucks to all the rest. Little chicks, come gather near. A wondrous story you will hear. I need my chicks. These are our nursery babies. Aren't they adorable? <laughs> <laughs> Two white doves on rafters high coo a quiet lullaby. Long ago in manger had a little baby Jesus lay. <laughs> the wise men from far away came to visit him one day. For he was born, the doves recall, to be the greatest king of all. The brown horses in their stalls, snug within the stable walls, tell of his birth. T'was long foretold by chosen men in days of old. The gray donkeys speak with pride. Where's my donkey? <laughs> the gray donkeys speak with pride, remembering one who gave a ride. Our brother donkey went with them from Nazareth to Bethlehem. The spotted calves now nibble lay. Where's my calf? The spotted calves now nibble hay like that on which the baby lay. They put him in a manger bed so he could rest his sleepy head. The goats all black and white. Where's my goat? <laughs> Describe the sky that holy night. <laughs> Jada, yeah. <laughs> A star appeared at early morn to mark the place where he was born. The nestling kitties, where's my kitty? Go lick your fur. <laughs> you can't see. <laughs> the, ne <laughs> the nestling kitties lick their fur. Lick your fur. <laughs> they nod their heads and softly purr. And he was wrapped in swaddling clothes to keep him warm from head to toes. The woolly sheep. Where's my woolly sheep? The woolly sheep down from the hill on Christmas Eve remember still. Shepherds heard the angels sing praises to the newborn king. The soft lambs say Jesus' name. He was the Lamb of God who came. Where's my lamb? <laughs> he was the greatest gift of love sent from his Father God above. The puppies listen well. <laughs> in, hopes, <laughs> in hopes that they in turn can tell the Christmas story another year for all the animals to hear. You need your bells. Get your bells. Go get your bell. You gotta get your bell. Go get your bell. Go get your bell. Go get your bell. Mama has your bell. Okay. The chimes ring out from far away, the lovely bells of Christmas Day. And every beast bows low his head. For the one small babe in a manger bed. Good job. Yay. Can you bow? Can you do this? Thank you. We're done. Yay. <laughs> Praise God we're done. <laughs> All right. You ready to go party?
By the way, if you are interested in helping work with children. Um... <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you for participating and having the children. They're going to go celebrate. Let's stand for a moment. Just take a moment to greet one another uh, before we begin the worship. War. Famine. Poverty. Disaster. They leave millions of victims behind. And many of them are children. And so many of them need help in so many ways that it's almost beyond imagining. Can you really make a difference? Where do you even start? You start with one. When you sponsor a child, you provide nutritious meals to feed his body and medicine to heal it. Which means he's more able to fight disease, grow up healthy, and work. When you sponsor a child, you give her education to feed her mind, which means she has a chance to get out of poverty and contribute to her family and community. When you sponsor a child, you show them that they're loved by God and that they matter. Millions of children need to have that love, that hope, the chance for a better life. So what can you do? Take one step. One child sponsored is one life changed forever. I know. I know. I know. I know. It's one of you sponsored me. This were the faithful sponsors uh, that sponsored me throughout my uh, elementary and my high school education. I was born and raised in the Philippines. Child sponsorship gave me the opportunity to have a quality education and to be able to dream as high as I can and, and move forward with my life. It brought me to where I am right now. Sponsorship is future for kids. It, it just opened a lot of opportunities. Now we can just dream big and, and be what we want to be. NCM's Child Sponsorship Program have contributed to what I am doing right now, being a web developer and a graphics designer at World Mission Communication Center. I am blessed because one of you sponsored me. One of you sponsored me. One of you sponsored me. Just to be sponsored means a lot of opportunities. I look back at it and I'm like, if I didn't have that education, I, I don't even know where, where I would be at, you know. And child sponsorship did that for me. It, it opened that door for me. How about showing the child sponsorship board after seeing all of those children up here? <laughs> no. Very precious. Oh, if you're wondering which one was my granddaughter? Oh, no, just kidding. But I did have, did have one up there. Um, Nazarene Missions, Global Missions, designates December as our um, Compassionate Ministry Month. And our local church has decided that our Compassionate Ministry focus for the month of December would be child sponsorship. So we just wanted to give you an introduction of what child sponsorship is in the Nazarene Church, what it does, what it supports, and most importantly, how you can become part of it. Um, the problem of surrounding um, the children in the world is huge, but like the video said, today we're just asking you to think about sponsoring one child. You have a couple different options and ways you can do that. Um, back at the visitor center, there's a card back there with children, so you can look through and you can say, goodness, I'm looking for a boy about 10 years old, or I want somebody whose birthday is the same as um, someone in your family, that type of thing. So you can choose a card right back there that has the child and tells more about them. Or there's a brochure that talks about child sponsorship, and you can go in the brochure, you can go online, or you can fill out a card, and you can s specifically say, I want to sponsor a child in India. I want a girl, and I'm looking for this age. So you have a couple different avenues and ways um, that you can do that. But what we're asking is that you really prayerfully consider this Christmas season how you can impact one child for the rest of their life. And I think what was important about the video message is that each of those sponsored children that you saw are continuing to impact um, people for the gospel around the world. So there's a lot of things you can support um, during the Christmas season and um, just as a whole for the, the way that you want to reach out and share the gospel. And we're just asking, asking you today to really strongly consider Nazarene Compassionate Ministries and this child sponsorship program. 
So we'll be highlighting this through the month of December, and we look forward to bringing a little bit more information to you. Thank you. Ushers come at this time. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings. Isn't that such a uh, powerful way to, to make an impact in people around the world? Our, the Church of the Nazarene has churches, uh, people in uh, over 100 and, I don't know, 50 world areas, 60 world areas. And so with the child sponsorship, what happens is they are connected with local uh, people who are actually on the ground, people who are living in that area that are able to help. So these programs, these ministries, these uh, opportunities to impact kids, uh, children's lives really do have a powerful effect. So I encourage you to be praying about that. Um, we have some Advent pack packets for families. If you'd like to take them, children's Advent packets so that you can uh, kind of follow the Advent season along with your, uh, with your family. You can pick those up on the way out. Someone will be handing those out. And then also one other thing, this Saturday we have a men's breakfast at 8 o'clock. And following the men's breakfast, uh, we will be going to uh, uh, John Keach's home where we have collected a, a bunch of wood and we will do our annual kind of wood cutting um, project in which we uh, next Saturday will cut and uh, split, uh, I don't know how many face cords of wood, and then we'll bring that the next Saturday here to the church in which we will distribute to families that uh, need wood this winter. So I just love you to come. We have a great time fellowshipping together. If you want to be a part of that, you are more than welcome. Uh, you can come to men's breakfast and enjoy that or just come to the cutting, wood cutting day and love to have you join us for that. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for all that you have given us. We give out of the overflow. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for the blessings uh, that we have been given uh, living where we live and having the families we have and the jobs we have. Uh, you have blessed us so much and it is a privilege and humbling to be able to help those around the world who are in need. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to do that and I pray your spirit would uh, just direct us in that. And then Father, we give uh, thankful for what you have done for us and we pray that you would bless all of our offerings may go to glorify your name build your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become His righteousness He humbled Himself
be seated. Well, we're going to look at a passage of scripture this morning in Luke's gospel, the gospel of Luke chapter 1, as we begin the Advent season. Again, last week we continue to work on the Advent season. Advent means uh, the arrival, the coming. Uh, we prepare uh, for hundreds of years. Christians have preparing for the coming of the Lord, uh, for the coming of Christmas. We prepare for Christmas. Now, I know that uh, uh, for the secular aspect of Christmas, for Christmas trees and Christmas presents and all that kind of aspect, uh, really preparation usually begins about Black Friday when the sales start. And uh, I'm sure most of you are already ready. You've already bought all the presents. Everything's already set. If Christmas were tomorrow, you'd be ready. But uh, spiritually, it takes some time to really fully understand and to allow God to speak to us during this Christmas season. So spiritual preparation is Advent. As we begin to think about what Christmas is about. And we begin to prepare for the coming of Christ. And the way we do that in the church. The way it does in scripture to prepare for Christ's coming. Is through a guy by the name of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the one who would come before Christ. And would prepare people. So that they would be ready to receive the message that Christ uh, was ready to give. And so uh, we're going to look at the story, Luke chapter 1, when Luke's gospel, when he begins to tell the story of Jesus. Luke's gospel is where we read about the shepherds and the manger. We read so much about Bethlehem. Uh, when we think about, uh, when Luke began his gospel, he began to tell the story of John the Baptist, beginning with his birth. And so Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 5, we read this story. Uh, about John the Baptist's parents. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blame blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty as he was, and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. We'll stop right there for a moment. So Zechariah was the priest. Uh, his wife's name was Elizabeth. They were both uh, righteous people, blamelessly following the laws of the Lord. And they were both old. They were both very old. Now that depends on how old you are, whether people are very old. I learned that lately as I'm getting older. 55 is not that old anymore. But... Uh, very old to me sounds like, well, I better be careful, right? <laughs> like 125. <laughs> I want to be safe. Very old, I'm thinking, well, I'm not going to say anymore because I just set myself up. They were old, very old, however old you think that is. And they, uh, they didn't have any children. And they were well past the age of having children. And, um, and so uh, Zechariah was a priest and it was his turn 
by, his, by the division of, that he was a part of, by casting lots, it was his turn to go to Jerusalem. They lived in the hill country near Bethlehem, uh, but it was his turn to come and to serve as a priest in the temple at Jerusalem. And so they left their home, uh, they came and probably stayed in a little place uh, near the temple, and every day... Uh, Zechariah would go before in the temple, go into the holy place, burn incense. There would be assembled uh, people gathering around outside, uh, faithful worshipers who came to worship. And Zechariah would come out after he has been in the temple praying for them, burning incense. He would come in and offer prayers, offer a blessing upon them. Uh, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he turn his face on you and and be gracious to you. May he give you peace, that kind of thing. And so uh, that was going on. It was an ordinary day in the temple. People gathered something like today. You come, you kind of have a feeling for what you're going to expect. You expect to get maybe a message. You expect to maybe get a blessing. And then you expect to go home. And and that's what they expected. An ordinary day. Zechariah was doing his priestly thing. Kind of a little like I am doing. And uh, right in the middle of the service. Right in the middle when he was offering burnt incense. A angel appeared to him and and we are told that he was gripped with fear we, we can imagine that something like that happened it was a long time uh, since anyone had been in the temple and had been gripped with fear well especially fear of the supernatural now many people uh, had gone into the temple out of fear for some army that was invading And uh, they would run into the temple out of fear for that army and they would pray to God and and hope that God would rescue them from some soldier with his sword. That had happened uh, way too often in Israel's history. But it had been a long time since anyone had gone in the temple and been gripped with fear because because of God's presence, because of an angel. Now that is what you would, should have been afraid of when you went in the temple. Uh, When God called people together and uh, revealed himself to them, people were afraid. We would be afraid. We understand that, right? I mean, after all, if you can just imagine, if you've ever told ghost stories, or if you've ever been in a room that's dark, and suddenly felt there was some other presence in there, just that itself would scare you. But we're talking about God revealing himself in some powerful way. I tell you what, every one of us would be frightened at that thought. And so... God would call the people together and he said, I'm going to reveal myself to you. And the first time he did that really in the Bible was in Exodus after the children of Israel were taken out of captivity. They came to Mount Sinai and God said, I want you to come as a people and I'm going to reveal myself to you. And so they came, they gathered around the mountain waiting for God to reveal himself and all of a sudden there was like a a storm, like a dark cloud, like fire and lightning and thunder and the top of the mountain, billows of smoke, it was on fire and the people saw it and they were terrified. And God said, I'm going to speak to you. And the people said, God, we really don't want to see this. We're terrified. And so they said, uh, let Moses go up to the mountain and you speak to Moses because we really don't want to experience this great fear of being in your presence. So God said, okay, Moses, come on up and and I'll speak to you and then you can speak to the people. So Moses climbs up that mountain that's on fire at the top. And the mountain's trembling and Moses is climbing up there and the people are looking at Moses and going, wow, look at him. He's going all the way up there. And so Moses goes up the mountain and he spends some time with God and the people uh, down below the mountain and they're kind of looking up thinking, man, I wonder what, wonder what happened to that guy. I wonder what happened to Moses. I mean, he might be dead. I don't know. And they wait. Days turn into weeks. And Moses has been up there a while and they... They're, they're kind of, they, they, they call the people together, they call Aaron together, and they say, Aaron, um, you know, we, we really don't know what happened to Moses. He might be dead for all we know, and even if he's alive, we're not sure we're thrilled about that guy who spent all that time up there coming back to us. So we would rather, uh, let's create our own gods. Let's, let's take some gold and turn it into golden calves and and make them 
we'll worship that. We'll worship these golden calves. This will be our God. And Aaron, you can be our priest because we really aren't thrilled about having to worship a God that is that frightening. And so that's exactly what they do. They worship these idols that they can create with their own hands that doesn't scare them and, um, and make Aaron the priest. And, uh, pardon me, just heard an air conditioner coming on. I'm not going to have that happen right now. <laughs> you guys don't know me. I am very much ADD, and so if something's happening up here, I've got to solve it before <laughs> I can go on. So, um, and, so, um, and so the people are down there worshiping a gold, these golden calves. And God says to Moses up on the mountain, Moses, the people are sinning. They've built an idol. They're making idols to worship. Moses, I'm done with these people. I'm done with them. Uh, we're going to start all over. I'm going to destroy the people. And Moses, and, and you know God is kind of setting Moses up for this. Moses intercedes like a priest should do. Uh, he intercedes for the people and he says... God, don't, don't destroy them. These are your people. You rescued them. And so God says, okay, I won't destroy them, but I don't, I just can't. They're so sinful. They keep sinning. I don't want to hang around them. And, God, and Moses says, no, we've got to have you with us. You've got to come with us, God. We want you in our presence. Even, even though we're a sinful people, we really need you. Because God, how will we be any different than anyone else? I mean, this is really what God is after. He is after people who truly want him. And God says, okay. And so Moses, make this temple, or make this, I'm sorry, make this tent, this tabernacle, and that'll be my house. God is bigger than obviously any tabernacle. His glory cannot be withheld within a tabernacle. But God says, I want you to make this tent, and uh, it'll have an outer place where people can gather and then it'll have a holy place where the priest will go to offer sacrifices like Zechariah did at the temple. And then they'll be in the center at the, at the end of it, the, the holy of holies, where the throne of God will be and the glory of God's presence will be there. Moses, make that tent and I will dwell with the people there and they will come and worship and they will offer sacrifices and these sacrifices will provide forgiveness for them so that I can fellowship with a, a sinful people, so that a holy God can interact with a, whole, with a sinful people. And so that's indeed what happens. And so Moses gets the, they work on the tabernacle, they put it together. Moses is the one who puts it all together. And then as soon as Moses gets done putting it together, a cloud, a storm comes out of nowhere and this dark cloud and the lightning, and the fire, and the glory of God just descends upon that tent, that tabernacle, so that Moses can't even enter it. And God says, okay, I'm going to meet with you at that tabernacle, Moses. And Moses would go in and meet with God, and he would come out, and he would have this glow about him. It would scare the Israelites. They would look at it and say, this guy, this, he's been in the presence of God, and it's frightening. But they would take that tabernacle wherever they would go across the desert and they would, wherever they would set up camp, they would stop right there. They would first put up the tabernacle, God's presence, and that cloud would go along with them, the cloud of God's glory, and it would be there. Eventually they go to the promised land and after they've been in the promised land for a while, a guy by the name of, of Solomon says, I'm going to build a temple for God. And so sure enough, they, instead of having a tent, they build a building. They build a temple uh, of, of cedar wood and stone and, and gold and silver and fine cloth. It is a magnificent building. And when Solomon and they get done with the temple, all of a sudden that great cloud, the glory of God just falls down on the temple and, and fills that place. And people are frightened and, and the priests have to stop. They can't even do their work anymore because this overwhelming presence of God is so glorious. I mean, the glory of God can ruin a worship service if you're not careful, and it did. The people just stopped. We can't do it. We can't even do anything. 
And so the glory of God fell on that temple. But just like what happened at Mount Sinai, uh, the people decided, you know, worshiping God, this holy God, this awesome God is, is difficult because he, he expects us to do what he wants. He expects us to live holy lives just as he is holy. And so the people began to want to worship other idols. They began to worship gods. Um, and they kept doing that, worshiping the gods around them, worshiping idols around them. And eventually God said, essentially, all right, you, you don't want to worship me. You don't want to experience my glory. You want to serve idols, so I'm going to let you. And about 600 years before Christ, Ezekiel, the prophet, in a dream, saw the temple. And all of a sudden, he saw this great cloud, this great cloud with uh, move up over the temple and a part, uh, beneath it was the, the very throne of God lifted up, the glory of God in this saw blazing glory, this fire. And it lifted up and lifted itself over the temple and then it moved away from the temple and it departed the temple and the glory of God left. Now the temple was still there but the glory of God had left and eventually a Babylonian army came in and the people ran to the temple trying to be saved from the army by the glory of God but God wasn't there in the temple anymore. His glory wasn't there anyway. And the Babylonians entered into the temple and destroyed it. Eventually, they were the people of Israel came back to the land. They rebuilt the temple. Worship started again. Sacrifices happened again. But, but no one ever saw a time when the glory of God came back to that temple. No one ever saw that. And sure enough, over the, as time would pass... Armies would surround Jerusalem and the people would run to the temple and they would be afraid and they would pray that God would show up. But, but God's glory wasn't there. See, that's one of the real disadvantages of serving an idol. An idol doesn't give you anything. It doesn't have any power. It can't save you. And the people were afraid of the glory of God, but the glory of God was powerful enough to save a person. Prophet Isaiah said it this way, when the people were afraid of all those enemy armies around them, he said, do not be afraid of them. Do not call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He's the one you are to regard. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. Fear the Lord and you don't have to worry about the Babylonians or the Assyrians or the Greeks or the Romans. Fear the Lord and you don't have anything to fear. But they wanted idols. And when they came running to the idols, the idols couldn't produce anything for them. 63 years before Christ, the Roman general Pompey conquered the city of Jerusalem. And after he conquered the city of Jerusalem, the first thing he wanted to do was to go to the temple. He wanted to see the temple, this great, glorious temple of the Lord that he had heard so much about. He wanted to see it, so he, he entered the courtyard and walked past the Holy of Holies where the priests were supposed to sacrifice. And he entered into the very Holy of Holies, a dangerous thing to do. But when he entered into the Holy of Holies, he found absolutely nothing. He was surprised, shocked that there wasn't an idol there. There wasn't some kind of image there. There was nothing. It was empty. And he turned around and pretty much left the temple the way it was. And so in Zechariah's day, the Romans are still in charge and they've allowed the temple to remain and the Jews are worshiping in the temple and Zechariah is doing his duty, burning incense, praying for the people and then the angel shows up and Zechariah is scared to death in the temple. Verse 13, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth 
for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or any other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before in the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the people, to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So he says, do not be afraid. The angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah in all his glory. And then the angel says, do not be afraid. Which I, I think is a little ironic. I mean, Gabriel, if you didn't want her to be a little afraid, maybe you could have dimmed your glow a little. Maybe you could have little, looked a little less angelic. <laughs> Obviously, he revealed himself in this, this glorious figure when he revealed himself that it scared Zechariah so much. He didn't have to do that. Many times in the Bible, angels appear like what happened to Abraham and what happened to Jacob. And they're really not sure they're angels at first. They just seem like a man or, or a person. But then eventually they find out, no, this is an angel. And Hebrews says that you have to be careful when you see people because sometimes people have entertained strangers, given hospitality to strangers, given food to strangers, and eventually they found out that they were angels. I think that's an interesting phrase, interesting thought. So, so the writer of Hebrews says, therefore, always be ready to help out someone in need because they might just be an angel. That person with the flat tire, that might be just an angel. That family that you're going to help out who needs some food, that, they might just be angels what Hebrews says. So, so uh, a- angels can appear in kind of human form, but, but Gabriel did not appear in human form. Gabriel had just come from the throne of God. <laughs> and uh, when he revealed himself in all this glory, of course it scared Zechariah. But then he says, do not be afraid. Your prayers have been answered. answered. You and Elizabeth are going to have a son. He's going to be the one Malachi prophesied about. He's going to be the one who's like John the Baptist. He is going to come and prepare people for the coming of the Lord. He is going to prepare people. Elijah the prophet, about 800 years before Christ, came to the people and he, he dealt with their sin. He dealt with their idolatry. He turned the people of Israel from their idolatry to serve the living God. That's what John the Baptist is going to do. He's going to get the people ready so that when Christ come, they can receive the message so that they can be ready for Christmas. And the only thing you have to do, Zechariah, is believe and give him the name John. Verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed in the temple so long. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but it remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. And after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Next week we'll talk more about Elizabeth. But, but, but here's Zechariah, scared to death, gripped with fear. And then the angel tells him what's going to happen. And then he says, well, how can I be sure of this? I mean, Gabriel just came to him in the powerful presence of the Lord And now he's asking for a sign as if an angelic appearance is not sign enough. But he demands a sign. Have you ever demanded a sign? Have you ever wanted a sign? 
God, prove yourself to me. Walter Rangren says there are two types of signs. There's a sign which arises out of trust, and then there's a sign which arises out of doubt. The first sign is like a sign uh, in which we want to express our trust and belief through a sign, like a wedding ring or like a marriage license. We love someone and we want to spend the rest of our lives with them. We want to trust them completely. Uh, So we want to have something that signifies our love and commitment, a sign of that commitment and love. And so we exchange rings and vows and we go through this marriage and we sign that marriage license. It shows us that we trust each other and we love each other and it becomes something very precious to us. It is a sign of our love. That kind of happened in Abraham in Genesis 15. We don't have time to get in there, but that's kind of what happened. Abraham says, I want a sign. And God says, okay, let's go through this covenant. And it became this sign of trust and love. Um, But these signs, a marriage license, a wedding ring, are not intended to come as a way to prove someone's love, right? I mean, it shouldn't be entered into a contract, even though a marriage license is legal and binding. It shouldn't be, here's a contract that I want you to sign so that I can be proven that you love me. I mean, that is not a great proposal, right? That's not a way to go. Say, can you sign this piece of paper and then I'll trust you? Can you give me a ring and then I'll trust you? Zechariah is asking God to prove himself after receiving this angelic appearance. But because, and the Lord responds, the angel responds, because you do not believe, because you are doubting, you will be mute during this whole time All of Elizabeth's pregnancy, you will be mute until the baby is born and you sign the paper that says his name is John. And so all this while, while, you know, Elizabeth's getting up and throwing up in the morning with morning sickness and she's thinking she has the flu, Zechariah is like... (laughs) And when she says, you know what, I feel a little funny, uh, Zechariah, it's almost, you know, if I didn't know better, I would be pregnant. Yeah, right. (laughs) Trying to... He's silent. He can't speak. He walks out of the temple after the angel has told him he can't speak. He walks out to the people who are waiting there to be blessed. The the blessing of Aaron. And he can't bless people because of his unbelief. And that, that happens. Not able to pray a blessing on people because really at heart, He had doubt. And so it's like the Lord is saying, I don't want you speaking unbelief into this situation. I'm going to do something amazing here and I really don't want your words messing things up. So I'm not going to let you speak unbelief. And so he has to watch. Until the baby is born and he writes John and then he lets out all this praise. Because he's watched it and seen what God has done and he's amazed. Oh, that we could speak words of faith. Words of blessing that flow out of faith. Jesus said, if you, in faith, if you speak to the mountain, it will be moved. And it's not the size of our faith. He said it can be as small as a mustard seed. It's really the size of our God. That's the thing. Do we serve An idol? Or do we serve the living God? Do we want to serve the living, awesome God? Or do we want to serve an idol that we can kind of control and that we can do exactly what we want with? So that we can live how we want and not have to deal with a God who is alive and a God who can sometimes be frightening, whose holiness would convict us. And we couldn't stand in his presence as sinful without his grace. Jesus said, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and then you don't have to worry about a whole lot of things. But the pagans who serve idols, they are always worrying, they're always running, they're always anxious, they're always dreading things because they've not encountered the living God who is greater than anything. 
So in our very anxious, idol-filled world, we need a greater vision of who God is. Or else even Christmas can become just another idol to replace God. Christmas can become what I get out of it. Rather than the amazing story that God comes to us. The angel Gabriel tells Zechariah, do not be afraid. But that is only after Gabriel Gabriel has scared him to death. (laughs) And I think those two things need to be together. We cannot be uh, free of fear because we've reduced God down to a little idol that wouldn't cause anyone to be afraid. No, we want to serve the living God who He is. And if the Creator of uh, of all things were to appear in our presence, we would all be shaken to our core. No, the goal is not to reduce God down to something small that that doesn't challenge us, that doesn't cause us to tremble at some of the way maybe we've lived and what we've said. No, we, we pray that we can encounter the real living God. But what happens after the living God has revealed His holiness to us, He says the words to us, Now don't be afraid. Standing in the glory of God, the awesome presence of God, he says to us, Now don't be afraid, because my holiness is not intended to destroy you. My holiness is intended to purify you, and to save you, and to rescue you. We can be afraid about a lot of things, we can be anxious about a lot of things. But if God is not an idol, it changes the the focus. We begin to see that if God is for us, who can be against us? I love what Annie Dillard says about our worship. She says, why do people in church seem seem like cheerful, brainless tourists? Now, that's not you guys, by the way. That sounds terrible. (laughs) Why do other people in church... Seem like cheerful, brainless tourists on a package tour of the absolute. Does anyone have the foggiest idea of what sort of power we blithely invoke? Whereas I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? The churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sex, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. She goes on to say, it is madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church, we should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews. For the sleeping God may wake someday and take offense, or the waking God may draw us to where we can never return. I mean, that's truly what worship is to be about. We come in the presence of the Almighty because He has called us. And we worship Him in awe and reverence. And then we realize that that God wants to dwell with us. Wants to live in our hearts. That God who cannot be held in the universe wants to live in our hearts and tells us, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid about anything. Put your trust in me. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for this Advent season. Christmas is sometimes can become so self-absorbed, self, uh, self-centered. It becomes about gifts, and it becomes about gifts for me and my family and the The fun we plan. Oh, that's wonderful, Lord. You've given us so many blessings. But Christmas is so much more. That you would come into our lives. 
that you, the Holy One, would come and, and set up your temple in our hearts. And Lord, of course, we would be scared to death when we think about it because there's stuff in our hearts that are not right. And there's stuff in our lives that are so wrong and so broken. But you come with all your glory and all your power and all your presence and all your love and you say, do not be afraid. Lord, that's Christmas. Opening our hearts to the arrival of Christ into our heart and making a place for him in the center of our lives. Making room for the Christ. And Father, we know that not only did Christ come once, but we believe Christ will come another time, again. And uh, sometimes, Lord, we ask for a sign. Lord, give us a sign when this is going to come. We, we expect something that's going to, you know, show us that now is the day. But, but your word says, just be ready. That there indeed is coming a day when our Lord will come to earth and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ and He shall reign forever and ever and then only what, only Lord you will matter and how we have served and loved for you will matter. And so Lord, as we prepare for Advent, may we prepare for your coming that could happen today, an ordinary day. We're going about our business and then the glory of God in a moment comes. But whether it comes in the second coming of the Lord or whether it comes in our daily walk when your Holy Spirit reveals yourself to us and we are caught up in your glory, may our hearts be ready to receive you. And then may we receive the word, do not be afraid. Help us, Lord, to open our hearts to you. And now, Father, I pray that you would be with each family here today. Thank you for these wonderful children that have been on stage, Lord. I pray your blessings upon them. I pray your blessings upon the families. I pray most of all, Lord, may you be the center of their lives. A solid rock, a foundation. And when we trust in you, we truly have nothing ultimately to be afraid of. Increase our faith. And may we speak words of faith and blessing this Christmas season. I pray your spirit would go with us as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. God bless.